Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is Corneau Oligopoly. By and large, this course is focused on duopolistic competition, competition between just two firms. But before we get to types of competition outside of the Corneau framework, I thought it would be worth describing what happens in a more generalized oligopoly setting, where we have more than two firms competing. This will give you a flavor on how to solve for oligopoly games more generally, and it'll allow us a nice comparison to a particular special case. Let's get to it. The Corneau framework is exactly as we have seen it before, but instead of having just two firms, we have n firms. Each of these n firms is simultaneously choosing a quantity of production with the price set by the market. And in particular, the price function is taking the total quantity of production as its input and outputting a price P. The notational difference is right here. This is the key notational difference between a duopoly and an oligopoly, where before the total quantity of production was just Q1 plus Q2, because there were only two firms. Now it's Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 and so forth until all the way until Qn. We're still using the same common functional form of A minus that total quantity. We're still having firms with unique marginal costs of production at CI. And we still have each firm with an objective function that is going to try to maximize profit. Same story. It's just n firms instead of two firms. To think about how firms should tackle this sort of problem, let's think about firm one's best response. How should firm one think about this? Well, firm one's goal is to maximize profits. And if you take its profit function, which is the price times its quantity of production minus its marginal cost times that quantity of production, and we substitute in the total quantity of production, not as Q1 plus Q2, but rather Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4, all the way through Qn, we still have a profit function for firm one. Firm one wants to maximize that profit function. And so our algorithm to do that is the same as before. We take the first order condition. We take the derivative of that profit function with respect to firm one's production, Q1, and we set it equal to zero. If we do that, and then we solve for Q1, then we have firm one's best response to a given set of other firm's productions. Specifically, firm one wants to produce A minus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 and so forth, plus Qn minus C1 divided by two. If you think back to what this looked like in a duopolistic competition setting, this is very similar. Inside of the parentheses here with an oligopoly, we have all the other firms' production decisions summed together. Before, with the duopoly, it was just Q2. In either case, with the duopoly or the oligopoly, what's going inside of those parentheses is every other firm's total production. With a duopoly, it's simple because there's only one other firm. With an oligopoly, there's a lot more things to add up, but in principle, it's the same idea. This is what firm one wants to produce. We can take this same sort of best response function strategy and generalize it to every other firm. So we have firm one's best response, just as we saw it before up top. We think about what firm two's best response is going to be. Well, we have A minus the total quantity of production that is not firm twos. So that's Q1, skip the Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, and so forth through Qn, minus C2, firm two's marginal cost of production, all divided by two. For firm three, inside of the parentheses, we have Q1, Q2, skip Q3, Q4, and so forth. And that generalizes all the way down to the nth firm, where inside of the parentheses we have q1 plus q2 plus q3 and so forth through qn minus 1, and we're not adding qn there because, of course, this is the nth firm. So we're excluding the nth firm's production. 
This is the best response function for each of the n firms. You will notice that means we have n unique equations with n unknown variables. And if you remember back to your high school algebra classes, when you have n equations with n unknowns, you can solve that. That is a system of equations that is solvable. In principle, we can derive an equilibrium by just finding the values of q1, q2, q3, and so forth that satisfy each of these equations. Like I said, in principle, that is possible. In practice, when you start having lots and lots of firms, it becomes computationally intensive. This is why, by and large, in classes, you will see just duopolistic settings, because a system of two equations with two unknowns is relatively easy to do. A system of three equations with three unknowns is also okay to do, but once you start getting to four or five or six, it becomes very difficult. In principle, it's possible. There's nothing that stops you from doing it, but the amount of work that's going to go into doing this and doing it correctly is quite a lot. Nevertheless, the key takeaway from this is that we actually have an equilibrium. It's just whatever satisfies this. Okay, that's kind of unsatisfying because we are not actually saying what the equilibrium is. But it turns out that if we have an oligopoly that is symmetric, we might be able to go somewhere with this. So let's have symmetric firms and look for a symmetric equilibrium. What I mean by that is we're going to suppose that each firm's marginal cost is simply equal to C. They are identical in that sense. And because they are identical in everything other than the label, whether they're firm one or firm two or firm three, it makes sense to look for a symmetric equilibrium where each of the firms is producing the same quantity of production. If we do that, let's think about firm one's best response function and see how that converts to the more symmetric setting, where instead of having each firm producing a different quantity, Q1, Q2, Q3, and so forth, imagine that they are all trying to produce the same quantity. So instead of having it Q in a subscript, we'll just have a general value of Q. And instead of having a C1, we'll just have a C. Then we have a generic best response function that looks like this. This is not just firm one's best response function. This is also firm two's and firm three's and so forth. Well, this is a single equation with a single unknown variable. You'll notice that inside of the parentheses, we have n minus one total values of q. And once you recognize that, we can just solve for q. And we get q as equal to a minus c divided by n plus one. So in the symmetric equilibrium, where we have symmetric firms, each firm produces a minus c divided by n plus one. And in fact, you'll see a connection between this and what we studied with a symmetric duopoly. With a symmetric duopoly, we saw that the equilibrium production for each firm would be a minus c divided by three. Sure enough, if you substitute n equal to two, which represents the duopoly, we get a minus c divided by three. So this oligopoly is in fact a generalized setting. It's taking a duopoly into account as well as a more generalized situation where we have n firms instead of just two. To finish up here, I wanna talk about a couple of metrics. First is the total quantity of production. We have n firms, each producing a minus c divided by n plus one. So that means that the total quantity of production is going to just simply be n times a minus c all divided by n plus one. If you think about what the limit of this is, as n approaches infinity, that total quantity of production is going to go to a minus c. There's a reason to think about what happens when n approaches infinity, because when n approaches infinity, we're essentially looking at perfect competition at that point. And if you think about the price under perfect competition, well, in equilibrium for any oligopoly, the price is A minus that total quantity of production. And if you take the limit of that as n approaches infinity, the limit there is C. The price is equal to the marginal cost of production, which is exactly what we would expect to happen with perfect competition. So you can see how oligopoly is a perfect slider here. It is capturing what happens not only with a duopoly, but in the limit, it is also capturing what should happen in a world with perfect competition. 
And because the price is equal to the marginal cost of production, that also means that each firm is getting no profit with perfect competition as n approaches infinity. It also means that the total profits for all the firms is also equal to zero as n approaches infinity. All right, that wraps up this lecture on Cournot oligopolies. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope to see you next time. Take care.